Henry Dunant was the child of a wealthy Swiss family in Geneva that was heavily influenced by a local Christian revival. Henry's parents taught him God wanted them to help others, wherever and whomever they might be. Young Henry led Bible studies in Geneva and founded the Swiss branch of the YMCA. On a business trip through Italy in 1859, Henry stumbled upon the aftermath of the Battle of Solferino. Henry dropped everything and spent weeks organizing help for the wounded soldiers on both sides. Then he wrote a book about his experience. Then he proposed a new movement to alleviate suffering in war, a movement that he named the Red Cross. Today, the movement Henry felt God calling him to start has saved more lives than any other movement in human history. Why do I bring this up? Because Henry Dunant is one of the people your kids will meet on Mr. Phil TV. Amazing people across history, from St. Teresa to Martin Luther King Jr. People whose faith in God inspired them to make the world a better place. Go to Mr. Phil TV for a free two-week trial. Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hey, Phil. Hi, Christian. How are you? Good. I'm happy. <laughs> oh, that's good. And so we'll, we'll I'll hold that thought. I'll circle back to you. And Sky Jatani. <laughs> hey, guys. Hi, Sky. I, I hear teenagers outside my door, so I hope you can't hear that. Really? As outside as the door of the Millennium not- Falcon? <laughs> yeah. As wow. long as your dog is not yakking underneath. No, my shit. dog is at my mom's house. How do you know they're teenagers and not stormtroopers? They, yeah, well, they could be. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we're zoom, we're zooming, we're zooming as we speak, and of course, Sky has a Star Wars backdrop, and so does Jason. Jason has a. What is that? Is that where they coordinated the attack on the Death Star? Yeah, it's the Rebel base on Yavin Four. Uh, the, yeah. Oh, yes. You haven't yeah. four. Yeah. You haven't four. Oh, yeah. Okay. Not I the was, first you haven't. Yeah. I would thought, is that you haven't uh, two and a half or I don't remember. No, it's and four. it's possible that we're going to put this up on YouTube and you can see his background. It, it is possible. We may put this video up on YouTube so you can see it if you want to. We'll decide that after we sing the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? your favorite podcast host if it's breakfast get your toast it's sky and phil and the holy post sky and phil and the holy post and sometimes christian christian you said you're happy what's uh you know there's a pandemic on so i guess that's a reason to be happy what other reasons do you have to be happy Well, I mean, you remember like the last time we had a podcast or two before, I was like, you can really learn what God wants to teach you during that time. And that's a great thing. So he's been doing that a lot with me, revealing a lot of sin and stuff, which I think is painful and happy. And then today he sent sunshine and it's beautiful. The weather finally broke here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's I'm weather enjoying. weather related, enjoying the simpler things, some yes. spiritual renewal and some good weather. Definitely. Okay. And being with my friends. I mean, thankfully we can still see each other. I know. Isn't technology amazing? Yeah. Thanks. Can you imagine what this whole thing would have been like a generation ago? What would it have been like, do you think? We Let's would speculate. have had to have used Skype. No, no, no. Like back in the 90s, let's say. Oh, in the 90s. Yeah. In the in dial-up era of okay. internet. Okay. Okay. I launched Veggie Tales in 1993. All the business deals I did were done by fax. Right. All the contract exchanges and negotiations were by fax. If you didn't have a fax machine, you could not interact. We had, so the first like four years of Veggie Tales no email. Um, I got a cell phone a few years in. I'm not, I didn't even have a laptop when I started. I didn't have enough money. They were crazy expensive back then. So that's, and that's just the lifespan of Bob and Larry and their vegetables. What's their shelf life? It's not that long. So that's not that long ago. (laughs) Jason, when were you born? 95. Oh my Lord. Okay. So (laughs) Bob is, Bob is two years older than actually Bob is five years older than you are because he was technically born in 90. Wow. Wow. So, so what you're saying, Phil, is if this had happened 
pre veggie tales. We would have been faxing each other, trying to do a podcast, which of course we wouldn't have known what that was <laughs> by fax. So there was no podcasting. We, were, we, we would be trying to do our radio show that we're hoping that one or two Christian radio stations will pick up and carry. We're doing that uh, over phones, over landlines. Oh, well, we could be like, remember when Kramer on Seinfeld got the set from, what is the old Merv Griffith show or something? He set it up in his apartment <laughs> and pretended to have a talk show. <laughs> we could do something like that where it's just for our own entertainment. Well, yeah, and do you remember we back- We couldn't be in the same room. That's true. That would be weird. Yeah. Do you remember back then we only had landlines, so they were corded, and we had answering machines. Mm-hmm. So we yeah. would leave messages with with cassette tapes in them. Yes. Yeah, because there wasn't. We didn't digital recording for answering machines came out in the early mid '90s as well. I'm worried that we're basically losing our audience here. <laughs> For yeah, anybody just, under 40. Just, just Christian and I. For everyone else, you know, it's just, it's listening to grandpa tell his stories. <laughs> mm, that's for Marley. So and you Marley are can, really a grandpa, which is weird. I it's know. still weird for me to think, not only do you have one grandchild, you have two. I know. I have dos. It's weird. Dos. What's grandchild in Spanish, Christian? Uh, grand, oh, that's French. Grandpère. I knew that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, that's the very first time a French wow. word came to my head other than a Spanish one because wow. I speak Spanish in France and not yeah. French. You speak <laughs> Spanish in France? France. <laughs> no, I, well, I did. The first time I went to France, I would open my mouth like when people were talking to me. I would I would want to engage with them in their language. And I do know un peu français. And so I would want to say something in French and I would open my mouth and Spanish would come out every time because my brain knew I needed a foreign language and that's just what I grabbed. It was weird. <laughs> See, when, I was in, wow. when I was in France a couple of months ago and I'd hear somebody speaking French to me, what came to my mind immediately was to respond to them the way that the French guys do in uh, Monty Python. Which mm. is? Which is to insult them. Insult them. With a French <laughs> accent. Yeah. I don't and, remember that part. Oh my that gosh, go that's over. the most classic part of the movie. Well, that's what inspired the French peas. In How did it tales. go? What did they say? In, holy grail. Uh, you really want us to repeat that? No, it's, it's Jean, Jean, Jean Cleese. <laughs> the Jean. French Jean Cleese. Yeah. Extremely funny. But let's go watch Holy Grail again. Yes, now I'll have to watch Holy Grail. All right. So I have one story I want to tell from my week of quarantine. I don't know if you can notice, I got a haircut. See, it's I got a, a haircut. It's snazzy. In the, it's a little blunt in the front. Thank you. I think that's a compliment, <laughs> uh, at least in France. They, the French, they love the blunt front look. The blunt fruit is what they say. Um, I needed a haircut. I tried to get a haircut the day of the closing, the great Illinois closing, because I was, I really, they announced it. Okay, we're closing Illinois, everyone. So if you know anyone in Indiana, say goodbye. We're closing in Illinois. And it was going to close at 5 p.m. And I realized, darn it, I need a haircut. I got to get a haircut, like stat. So I raced over to Sports Clips at 3 p.m. and they'd already closed. Like, well, we're, we're done. So, and then I was like, oh, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna turn into Grizzly Adams here. How long is this gonna go? I hope I can make it through the other side. So it became clear, I am not gonna make it through the other side. I need a haircut. My wife used to cut my hair up until about 20 years ago when it became too stressful for our relationship and I opted for <laughs> professional <laughs> intervention. So I finally had to break down and say, honey, I think you, I think, I think you need to cut my hair. <laughs> so, and she's never done it with clippers because when she cut it, I actually had a different haircut. It was that long ago. So she had never cut it when it's this short where it's cut with clippers. We thought, we have clippers, right? I think we have clippers. She said, go up to the bathroom, get the clippers. I went up, I couldn't find the clippers. I remembered though, wait a minute, I think I've seen our clippers in the garage, like in storage. I'm not sure why, but I'm going through the garage the other day, I think I saw our clippers. So I went out to the garage, going through every cabinet. Sure enough, there's our wall, you know, that company that makes all the world's clippers, W-A-H-L. Yeah. Oh, I gotta get taco. Yeah, yeah, get Taco because they, you know, we'll set up an affiliate relationship with Wall because of this episode. Um, there's their Wall Clippers. So I get them out. They're bigger than, you know, I was like, wow, these are old. So I get them out in the kitchen and my wife, we're trying to figure out, okay, how did these work again? Have we ever, how long has it been since we used these? 
So we, I remember at sports clips, they say, you're a five, you're doing five. And I go, five, five. And there was actually an attachment for these clippers that had the number five on it. So I thought, okay, I guess that's what it is. We'll put that attachment on. We fire them up. She puts them on my hair and they don't do anything. They're like, she's, so she's rubbing these clippers <laughs> all over my head and they're just not doing anything. So we finally get, had to give up. It's like, we don't understand these clippers. These clippers are broken. Maybe they used to work. I don't know. So we put them down. Uh, we switched to my beard trimmer and try to use that, <laughs> which was actually working a little bit. But while we were doing that, my son came in um, and, and he, he said, oh, whose clippers are those? And I said, well, there are clippers. He said, no, our clippers are gray. And we look at him and I was like, well, whose clippers are... Oh, no. Whose clippers are these? I have a feeling I know where this is going. And he picked them up and he read the brand name on them and it said, Stable Mate. <laughs> <laughs> the, the people who lived in the house before us had horses. <laughs> they were horse clippers. <laughs> they were someone else's horse clippers. Very old, very used on many horses that my wife was rubbing all over my head. <laughs> so, so then she went up to the bathroom where I had looked and said, oh, here are our clippers. They were, right here. They were much smaller. Much, you know, they, that might have been a clue that they said stable mate on them. I don't know. We didn't notice. We didn't read the brand. How, wait, how wide is... <laughs> are the because that I would imagine they'd no, be. I don't know if they're just for manes. Are they you, you clip manes? You don't clip a horse, they're not no, 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 furry no. like no, sheep. No, 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 no. yeah. No, look, I'm your horse girl, so okay, with what do you manes, clip on a horse <laughs> with manes? You actually, you know, you use your comb and you wrap it and you pull the hair out of the mane. That's how you thin the mane, or you do trim it. But those clippers oftentimes yeah, are what are they for like, right at the neck like okay. where the mane and the neck meet. Okay. Um, or if you want to shave something so that, you know, like for a competition, sometimes different parts are shaved for shave fancy something? Look. Yeah. So, so anyway. no, wow. it's not for their yeah. mane. So we learned a valuable lesson. I had to cut my husband's hair also, and it this was also week? an adventure. And uh it does put a little strain on the relationship i gotta yeah. say yeah my marriage is doing great <laughs> yeah 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 what jason have you gotten a haircut i haven't no okay so still doing just funny? fine did you guys hear that there was a run on all of the hair clipping products there was uh, a run on there was a run on hair dye hair dye hair and dad. the clippers really? and then meat was the next thing because everything was closing yeah right i Those haven't I haven't right. shaved in three weeks. Well, I have a full beard going. That's exciting. I'm really thankful because my hairdresser and I decided a few months ago that we would not color my hair all over and stop start blending in my natural hair color with oh, my color so thinking. that when it grows out, you don't have this like raccoon line in your hair. <laughs> yeah. And I'm so glad we made that decision because now, see, like you can't really tell. It's That's good. Nice. That's good. So if you're if you're if we do end up posting this video somewhere and you're watching it, you'll know what we're you can you can judge my hair. Is it? Do you feel it's overly blunt? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's a little vote. equine. We'll do an uh, yeah, and a little equine. It's just a little horsey. Your new mm -hmm. haircut, Phil. It's just a little bit horsey. Can I just ask you guys real quick to do a check in about like how your week has gone in terms of the quarantine, like your emotional, like I read somebody in the news saying this week it hit me, you know, this week I was crying this week. And for me personally, that actually did happen when my son Josh's school announced they were done for the year. And that means my last child who is a senior has no senior sports, no senior activities, no graduation probably. And and I just, I couldn't help crying. I mean, it was really hard and it seems like a silly thing, but like all, a lot of the other stuff we can do again, he won't ever get that back. So that was hard for me. Is there stuff for you guys? Are you, are you getting antsy? Do you want to go outside? Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm doing better, honestly, partly because of the weather. Um, 
my oldest daughter, it's her senior year too. And she, I think she had prepared emotionally for a while knowing that she wasn't going back to school and none of these senior activities were going to happen, but she's begun to worry about going away to college in the fall and will that happen or not? So that's been on. You mean worry about not going away to college right, in the fall. Right. Right. Um, so that, that's kind of the new topic of anxiety right now, but no, we're doing okay. Okay. I'm, we're doing okay other than just the chaos of our home, which is going to greatly improve in six days. Because? Our son-in-law comes home. Ah. He's been gone for 120 days. That's fabulous. He comes home on Saturday. Yes, there will be two parents for the three-year-old. That's great. So uh, I'll be sleeping Maybe you better. can get some sleep. Yeah. What about you, Jason? No, uh, I, I'm an introvert, so this has been great. <laughs> <laughs> he's, just, he's just mapping out the attack on the Death Star over yeah, and over again. Just in the hanging out in my bunker. It's fine. <laughs> privacy of his underground lair. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it hasn't. It's not getting. I mean, the more more bad news. You know, there's so much news about how hard it is to be a, a healthcare worker, and yeah. and you know the terrible stories of people who were dying alone and can't. You know, you can't be with your family while you're dying. So it's very hard to say, hey, this is kind of fun because it's very clearly not fun, you know, for the, for the, and the people that are losing their jobs and the economy and, you know, worried about all my favorite little mom and pop restaurants, you know, are they ever going to open again? Is that it? Because, you know, I knew the people that worked there and they're nice people and they're fun little restaurants, coffee shops, my favorite little coffee shops, are they ever coming back? So it's, there's a lot of like, sadness. This is, yeah, this isn't just, you know, oh, can't wait for this to be done. It's like, when is it, yeah. is it well, ever done? I, I was super sad when I read all the stories about how all the big companies and big banks got all the money and the small business ones like you're talking about didn't even mine, you know, I have yeah. two small businesses and applied for the small business administration loan. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of, uh, believe it or not, corruption going on in all this. I, I got absolutely unloaded on, on Twitter when I made a comment about how in Florida they designated the WWE as an essential business. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? No, yes. Uh, I saw that they did that. I didn't see you getting unloaded on. Yeah. It. People were really upset with me because I, I made a comment about, really, you know, is this really an essential business? And a bunch of people are like, absolutely it is. We have to do it. But it's also a fact that Vince McMahon, I think is his name, the guy who's the yeah. head of that thing, he's very politically connected to the governor of Florida and to Donald Trump. So there seems to be some shenanigans going on about which businesses get passes and which ones have to close and which ones are getting loans and which ones aren't. And then, of course, the inspector general who's in charge of making sure there is no corruption over that $2 trillion bill was it's fired. Gone. So yeah. there's, no, there's no one making sure that... The fox right. stays out of the hen house here. Right. Did you see that? Uh, I think it was one of the big businesses gave back $10 million. Steak and shake. Steak uh, and shake shack. shack. Shake shack. Sorry. Steak. Steak. <laughs> yeah, right. Shake shack. One of those. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think for me, it's really heartbreaking because, uh, it, you know, it just erodes the trust in our government even more. What are we going to do? What's going to bring us together? Hulk Hogan. <laughs> Hulk Hogan. Speaking Isn't he of, dead? No. no, he's not dead. You're, no, he's not dead. You're thinking of um, Don Rickles. He died. <laughs> Hulk Hogan says, last week, Hulk Hogan said, God has taken away everything we worship. I bet you didn't think that your spiritual discernment for this uh, episode pandemic would be coming from Hulk Hogan. Did you? Did you think that? I knew that he had had a conversion because I'd seen something by him. So I am not surprised. He's kind of this kind of guy that's got an interesting way of looking at things and a personality to make it flamboyant. So what yes. did he say? Celebrity wrestler Hulk Hogan relayed some of his spiritual insight pertaining to the COVID-19 pandemic, asserting that perhaps God might be making people rethink their values. Recalling the plagues of Egypt, which were designed to humiliate the pagan deities, Hogan said that our modern gods, from sports to celebrity to money, have been taken from us by this pandemic. 
He says, uh, he wrote a big blog post about this. In three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I'll shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I'll shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I'll shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I'll make it where you can't go to church. Uh, The irony is we still have professional wrestling. (laughs) You want to worship me, Hulk Hogan? I'm good. We're still on. Uh, His concluding statement was, maybe we don't need a vaccine. Maybe we need to take this time of isolation from the distractions of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in the world that really matters, Netflix. No, he said Jesus. He said, it's funny that God didn't take away Netflix or any of the streaming services, so we can still worship those. So, you know, I give him a kind of an A for effort, but I think he's also saying that uh, God might be in the business of killing lots of people in retirement homes so that we won't watch sports anymore. Well, I think, I think his point is an interesting one, and I think there is some truth to it. I think ascribing that I know why God did X, Y, Z presents a problem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, could, you know, of course we know that God allows things to happen if we believe that he's God of the universe. Um, but I don't necessarily believe that he's sitting up there saying, you know, I'm going to punish you and put you through terrible things uh, because I can and I'm going to shape your behavior. That's not the God that yeah, I know. Well, we had this conversation two weeks ago about uh, N.T. Wright's piece that he wrote for Time Magazine, um, where he was also saying, wait, whoa, whoa, slow down. You know, this isn't about God doing things to us. And we talked about that when, when we so easily go there, you know, this disaster is God hurting this group. This disaster is God punishing this group that we're really projecting from the Old Testament to the, the, a special relationship in the history of Israel and how God blessed and cursed Israel and the enemies of Israel and, you know, effectively living in the wrong testament of, of how God would work with the church and or America and or enemies of America and or the church, and it gets really messed up. So, Sky. Uh, Hulk Hogan, is he doing, uh, is it a public service? Is it a net positive if it makes people think about idols? Or is it confusing because he's uh, attributing natural disaster to God's direct intervention? You know, they can all be true and not true at the same time, not to sound completely wishy-washy. Wow, thanks for that answer. I know. <laughs> but I, I agree with N.T. Wright. I wouldn't attribute any single simple explanation for any of this and our first instinct ought to be lament and i but there is a value i'll give hulk hogan this there is a value in individually or even as a household or perhaps even as a, as a church community to use this time for self-reflection and for one person it might be wow i realize there are things in my life that i have a disproportionate allegiance to that needs to be corrected that i've been able to see because of this current situation. And that's great. It, right. There may be others who realize uh, during this pandemic, I have been too disconnected from my community. And I, when, when this ends, I need to serve more. It, we can take different lessons from this, but it, it, the universal call to self-reflection, which I think he is, Hulk Hogan is calling us to, is a good one. But I don't he, know what that self-reflection will reveal. And are you in alignment with him that those things can very easily be our idols? Anything can be an idol. Yeah. So sure. Okay. So thanks, Hulk Hogan. Have you heard anyone in, in the last week or two throw out their own? Here's why God is letting this happen. Here's what we're supposed to be learning from this. I'm I'm hearing some of the eschatological nuts are coming out of the woodwork. Mm. So that's fun. I, I'll I'll have eschatological nuts as an afternoon snack. I do want to throw good, out a good Christ- protein. <laughs> I do want to throw out one question in all seriousness. Yes. So hey, this- hey it's time for that segment we like to call Christian Asks. Okay, <laughs> yes. go. So I do think that, you know, in the Bible, God said, or Jesus said, 
you know, we don't know the time and we in, we are in the time of the birth pangs, whatever they are. And, you know, Revelation does talk about whether it's earthquakes or famine or, you know, all sorts of other things that are pestilence. quote unquote. Does yeah. it mention pestilence? It does. Those are birth pangs. So clearly we're still in them, right? Well, I, this gets, this is a bigger matzo ball to deal with, but Part of it is, yeah, this is a pretty dramatic moment in our lifetimes, but when you look at the scope of history, it's really not. Um, For example, I mean, since World War II, we have been living through the most peaceful period in human history when it comes to length of life, wealth. Um, You know that poverty has been cut by two thirds in the last 40 years in the world? Like it, it is a an incredibly peaceful time overall to be alive. More people die today from self-inflicted wounds than from warfare. Hmm. More people die today from having too much food than from having too little. So to take this one pandemic and say, oh my gosh, this is it. This is, you know, Christ is returning because these are the birth pangs of the end times. It's, it's really to be historically naive. Things were far worse during the Spanish flu Things were far worse during World War One and World War Two. Things were far worse during the Middle Ages than they are today. Um, so I, I just I have a when people start screaming about this is it, it, it's because their their sense of history doesn't go back any further than their own childhood. But but mm. at some point, don't you think that there is going to be an escalation of something? Because I mean, Revelation did say that. Well, that comes down to interpretation. There are what do you mean? <laughs> there are certain views of uh, both Jesus' comments in like Matthew twenty four, as well as Revelation, which argue a lot of the. I, I'm not necessarily saying this is what I agree with, but uh, there's one interpretive view that says those were all things that Jesus was predicting were to happen before the fall of Jerusalem in seventy A.D. That it was a first century context for the fall of Jerusalem and doesn't have any bearing on 2000 years later. That's one interpretive view. There are others um, throughout most of Christian history. The view was a post millennial view, which argued the world was actually going to get better and better and better. And then Christ would return. That didn't really change until about a hundred, 120 years ago when the premillennial view came into vogue, which said, no, the world's going to get worse and worse and worse. And that view really took off after World War I when we saw the destructive power of technology for the first time. So this idea that the world's going to deteriorate into chaos is really only a view that a lot of Christians have held for about the last century. All right. Well, then what, what is your <laughs> so particular... what's the right view, Scott? Yeah, what what's, is your what's particular the right view? <laughs> Uh, I think the right view is to not get bent out of shape on those particulars and instead focus on the overarching message of Revelation, which is the fact that the lamb who was slain reigns and will be vindicated and all those who belong to him will reign with him on the earth. That's the overwhelming message of Revelation and those who are aligned against him and who are persecuting his people will get their comeuppance. That's and we message. should be ready for him to come back any minute. Sure. We should just always make sure we're ready and not looking for signs that he's coming. Right. And to live in his reign now rather than think Waiting that we're in a holding pattern reign. until he comes and then his reign. be. He's reigning now and we are to be right. part of that reign now and to manifest his kingdom to our uh, fullest capacity now. But to get all caught up in the particulars of, you know, what different events in, in the headlines means, I think is to miss the point. And if you would love to have that explained to your kids, there's a whole segment on Mr. Phil TV that explains just what Sky just explained, except for kids. There you go. What's it called? Well, it's the, uh, the uh, Revelation segment in uh, What's in the Bible. So about okay. a 20-minute t- unpacking of Revelation for kids that focuses on the idea of not losing sight of the forest for the trees. Uh, and and where can they find that? The big picture. <laughs> MrPhil.tv. If you go to MrPhil.tv, you can have a free two-week trial, and you can explain the end times to your kids and maybe to yourself even. Um, with a nice little, I think it might, we might've broken it up into two. Did we break that up into two parts, Jason? Cause it was big. 
it's a it's hard to unpack i don't i wasn't here for what's in the bible <laughs> no you had to edit it for mr phil tv i think we cut it oh that two, segment uh yeah, that segment i think jesenia edited, edited that oh one. jesenia so did. let me check okay. oh no that's okay that's okay. not that Never important mind. anyway if you want to learn about revelation in a kid-friendly way or a modern adult stuff that way. the thing that i always love about your stuff phil is you and sky this is where i see you as very similar you're able to take big complicated concepts and boil them down so that even the simplest minds like mine can understand a broad theological concept and you know i learn stuff all the time when i whether it was veggie tales or what's in the bible um, or even the devotionals that you do uh, your particular way of looking at things, I think, is helpful for adults as well as kids. So even if you don't have kids, I would recommend you go and look it up. Why, thank you, Christian. That's awfully nice of you. Yeah, it's Mr. Phil TV is off to a good start. We got parents checking it out. They're making it part of their uh, quarantine ritual with their kids and also using it on Sunday morning as a you know, kids' church, uh, virtual kids' church sort of uh, replacement while they can't go to church. So that's encouraging. You... Speaking of church, can I give a shout out to David Gunger? Yeah, what's David Gunger doing? So, do you guys remember him when he came on our podcast? Yeah, yep. yeah. He so, he is the brother of Michael Gunger. Yes, Michael Gunger of the band Gunger. David Gunger has his own band, um, which is called The, the Brilliance. Brilliance. The Brilliance. Thank you. And they're the worship leaders for Good Shepherd Church in New York, which I participated in this weekend. And it was so amazing. Uh, wow. I really have been enjoying what they're doing there. So are we going to have, okay, that's an interesting, I just saw someone else tweet about, you know, one of the silver linings of this quarantine thing is that I got to spend Sunday morning watching this other church and I <laughs> really enjoyed it. I visited um, three already. <laughs> yeah. Are, are people going to have a hard time actually returning to their own church uh, when they have virtually participated in something that they liked much more from a thousand miles away? You are opening a large can of worms, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great question because... Well, it is. Go ahead, Christian. Well, I'm just saying it's a great question. So, for example, this Good Shepherd New York. It's very ecumenical. And so it's a good marriage of, you know, uh, sort of the liturgy. And it's, but it's got wonderful, original, you know, beautiful music. It's very contemplative. There's nothing like that that I have found around here. Yeah. Um, and, but at least I know a different way to worship. So I don't, I can't leave my church and go to the one in New York, but. Right. I can think outside the box about right. how to I bring. I wonder, will most of these churches stop streaming, you know, once, once this is over and it won't be possible to do that anymore? I don't know if they, it, it depends if this goes for a while and they end up realizing that there are people at a distance who are engaging with their services and to be crass about it are donating, supporting, supporting them. Right. Yeah. Then they may well keep it going. Right. Um, and this, this goes back to the, something we've talked about before, which is when we equate church with content, content is very easy to disincarnate and transmit or stream. And so you can do that. If you view church as a community, you right. can't really disincarnate that. So it, we may, I mean, there's good and bad in this. We may end up to the, come to the place of realizing that the essential community that I need of brothers and sisters who support one another in their life of faith, that needs to be local and incarnate. But where I get my Bible teaching, the music I listen to, the, uh, the doctrines I'm taught, does that have to come from my um, proximate right. pastor? And right. we've been doing that for a long time anyway. I mean, we've talked about your, your grandfather being a radio preacher, Phil, and, uh, and your great-grandfather. And just the way tech, Christians are doing this all the time already. I've, when I was a pastor, I heard people all the time tell me um, that the person, and they didn't mean this as an insult, I assume, but that the person who's really influencing them is such and such pastor who had a podcast whose sermons they listened to every week, but it wasn't what they were hearing in our pulpit. Right. So we've already done this for a long time. We've just kind of thrown gasoline on it. And now people may end up making a permanent change in how they engage church. Hmm. Question is, will the leadership of local churches recognize that and 
focus their efforts on what cannot be disincarnated. Right. And what does that look like? Question. Here's a question. Do you think there are people that had stopped going to church that are now, you know, because, hey, Sunday morning is a better day for youth sports and or brunch, going out for brunch. And now that they're stuck at home, are tuning in to a church for the first time in a long time. Do you think that's happening? Wouldn't that I don't, be interesting? I don't know. But I, again, if it lasts for some time, we might get some data on that. Next week, I'm going to be on... Um, the new Barna podcast for church oh, leaders. Oh, really? So maybe when I'm with them, I'll hear some some stats on what's going on. I guess I didn't, I must have well, missed my invitation. And that I'm question <laughs> makes me think about, I've listened to you guys talk about church history, you know, and you've talked about, you know, just different, uh, like it's almost kind of like strata that when you guys talk about it, you know, whether it's post Christian or pre, I don't know, whatever, all, you know, all those like buzzwords that I don't know, but, and you always say there's some inciting event that pushes us into this next realm of, you know, whatever, you know, intellectualism changed to whatever, you know what, you can do it, I cannot. But my point is, we're in this like major turning point, what's going to happen What's it going to be called when we look back and we see the data and we see how this changes our worship or our idea of church or our interaction or non-interaction of church? Do you think this will be a new thing altogether that happens after this is over? I think it depends how long this lasts and what the economic fallout is and how long that lasts. I mean, Andy Crouch has been writing about this and he's talking about, we need to not view this pandemic as a blizzard, but as a kind of mini ice age. Oh, so that's one way of looking at it. Um, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> right. Unless we get mammoths. Do we get mammoths? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you might be right, Christian. The parallel that comes to my mind is, you know, the cold war basically ended in 1991 when the Soviet Union fell. And the United States military, and you might be aware of this, Christian, because of your military engagement, but the and U.S. military, know. but prior to that, the U.S. military's kind of mantra was we need to be equipped to fight on two fronts equally, coming out of World War II and into the Cold War. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, during the first Bush administration and then Clinton's administration, there was a sense of we need to reform our military to the post-Cold War realities. And there were some changes that happened but it really didn't accelerate until 9-11. Right. After 9-11, the U.S. military fundamentally changed its approach because its enemy was not the Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc. It was guerrilla warfare in Afghanistan or Iraq. And so, you know, the CIA changed its tactics. The military intelligence changed their tactics. Everything's been different since 9-11. I think something similar might be going on where we've had all this technology that's been kind of nipping at the church and changing the way we've done things. And we've had podcasts and some streaming and multi-site stuff going on, but it hasn't been a dramatic change to most churches. This coronavirus pandemic might be the 9-11 that takes all that latent technological capacity and suddenly throws gasoline on it. And on the other side of this, we might see a very different looking church in the way we function. Um, but I don't know. It's too soon. I don't want to be a well, you know, and like, pretend I'm a prophet and know exactly what's going to happen. For for you one of the Hulk things Hogan. that was <laughs> you and Hulk Hogan. Uh, one of the things that I think has been interesting is I don't know if you guys have seen the Bible, what the Bible Project is doing, but they're doing a church at home series. So every week they'll put out a little small talk. Tim will do a little small talk. They'll have one of their videos, and then they have scripture readings and stuff you can do, sort of like in a home church sitting setting. Um, which I've been using during the week for like my devotional stuff, not just necessarily church, but it's an interesting way because that could be easily adapted into the home church setting if people wanted to get together and do a small home church thing. Right. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, depending on how the States reopen, it might be you're allowed groups of 10 people or 50 people or something like that, but that could create opportunity for tools like that to be used. Cause maybe we will start gathering 10, 20, 30, 40 people in a home for months at a time before we're able to regather with hundreds or thousands of people in the large groups. So we might see this go through different permutations. So wrapping up that thought, Willow Creek announced their new pastor this week. Yeah. 
they finally really? have a permanent replacement for Bill Hybels. Interesting time to come in to be the new pastor of Willow Creek. Of a mega church. A Who mega is church it? that can't meet. It's a guy from Michigan who was a pastor of a mega church in Michigan. I forget his name. I'd never heard of him. Hmm. Yeah, he, apparently he went to Wheaton College. Yeah, he's a Wheaton College kid went started a mega church and has a, like it's kind of funny you know recruiting from smaller mega churches to larger mega churches and then the smaller mega church has to recruit from an even smaller mega church to sounds recruit. like sports yeah i know <laughs> hey we're calling you up from the minors you were doing double a you were doing pretty well it's, it's you got the call you got the phone call johnny Grab i'm in the glove. show i'm in the big show okay uh what else do we have a guest Scott. we do and and if this video goes out to everybody the guest portion will not be on it so oh, if you're watching okay. this you have to get the regular podcast audio feed to get the guest and it's going to be an interesting one um we're talking about uh the op opioid epidemic and drug addiction and starting out with talking about William Wilberforce and his, uh, his addiction to drugs, which we never talk about, which is, is really, it's a great conversation. I think people will enjoy it. Fascinating. I just did an entire e-learning on opioid addiction for doctors. What? It was, yeah, fascinating. You mean you did the audio oh, you did recording the, for it? You read yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Like, is that just a fascination of yours? <laughs> no, no, no. I did get something you need to tell us about. <laughs> what I did learn was they're having to educate the doctors uh, because they've been over prescribing yep. and they learned just like if you order a, um, like an extra large fry, you're going to eat all the fries. But if you order a small fry, you'll eat less fries. And so they're like, you need to prescribe less medication so people will take less medication. You would think that would be a no brainer. Wow. <laughs> but apparently they're wow. over prescribing. Then they get out and everybody's selling them and then they get addicted yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, you, you'd be, there's a, there's some stuff out there now talking about some of the pharmaceutical companies that have manufactured these painkillers and their complicity in this pandemic, this epidemic of, of drug addiction, because they're raking in millions and millions of dollars every year by the over prescription of these painkillers. Even you remember, it, it wasn't that long ago when they started putting those little charts in the doctor's office that had the smiley face and the frown face on it, And they'd ask you your pain from one to 10. Yes. They didn't have that years ago. That's a pretty recent, thing now everyone has it because a pharmaceutical company trained the doctors and nurses to use that to push more opioid drug uh, painkillers so there's been all these kind of tactics used for the last 10 20 years now to really drive up the the use of those drugs and they've made millions and millions and millions of dollars and well we should uh, have a guest on to talk about that what do you what do you think about well he's coming up what do you think about that idea? Okay. Timothy McMahon King will be here. Timothy McMahon King? Mm -hmm. is, that McMahon, is that a hyphenated name? No, but apparently... Uh, McMahon, McMahon King? He and I talked about this off the air. When he and his wife got married, they combined their last names. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, you can only do that for a couple of generations before it gets unwieldy. <laughs> okay, here comes the guest. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up uh, last week for our 400th. This is the exciting, historic 401st, the fighting 401st. And uh, we will see you all next week. Stay safe, and uh, but, but keep practicing your faith visibly. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. See you guys. Hey everyone, this is Sky. Like many of you, I've got some extra time on my hands because of this quarantine, so I've decided to try something new. I've created an audio version of With God Daily. That means rather than just reading my daily devotionals, you can now hear my melodious voice speaking to you every morning. And I'm not just reading the reflections, but also passages of the Old and New Testaments as well as the historic prayers of the week. This is a difficult time for a lot of us, and unfortunately, there are plenty of unthoughtful religious leaders out there offering all kinds of messages right now of blame or judgment or just unhelpful sentimentality about this whole pandemic. But With God Daily is different. I've tried to keep it deeply rooted in scripture and history and current events. It doesn't offer easy answers, and it doesn't pull any punches. Instead, it's designed to draw you into deeper communion with God and to show you the current world through the lens of faith rather than fear. I always try to keep it smart, and I promise it's never sappy. And as I've said many times, 
This is the daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. And now it's got audio. So check it out today or download the app for your phone by visiting withgoddaily.com. My conversation today is with Timothy McMahon King. He's a writer. He works for numerous nonprofits and does some consulting. He's written a lot for Sojourners, where he served as the chief strategy officer, and he's the author of a book called Addiction Nation, What the Opioid Crisis Reveals About Us. I first encountered his writing in an article he did about William Wilberforce and his drug addiction, which gets downplayed a lot by Christian authors and the church. And McMahon says this is probably because we tend to equate drug addiction with moral failure. And he wants to kind of reframe that and help us think differently about drug addiction so that we can actually serve and treat those in our communities who are struggling with this terrible problem. Here's my conversation with Timothy McMahon King. Okay, Timothy McMahon King, welcome to the Holy Post. We're glad you're with us. Hey, thanks for having me. So the the reason you came to my attention was an article that you wrote, uh, where was it? Sojourners, um, about William Wilberforce. And for those who may not be familiar with Wilberforce, give us the, the general uh, historic place that Wilberforce plays, particularly for Christians and the way he's typically presented. What's, what's kind of his shtick? Yeah, I had heard about Wilberforce as this kind of moral giant and also great exemplar of how Christians can be true to their faith and at the same time engage important political and social issues. So Wilberforce had been known for being kind of a wealthier guy, living life fancy and free. He became a member of the British Parliament, but then had a really substantive kind of born again Christian experience where his life was flipped upside down and he dedicated himself to the cause of ending the slave trade in Great Britain. And it took him decades to do. It was failure after failure. He was laughed about. He was a point of ridicule for a lot of people for a long time. And then when it finally passed, everyone else had kind of seen like, of course this has happened. Of course it was inevitable. So I was first introduced to that story of this guy is a paragon of faithfulness and also is someone to look up to who just keeps going and keeps persisting even in the face of what looks like certain failure. Yeah, he really is held up as a poster child of of Christian faithfulness in the public square. And there's been numerous biographies written about him. Eric Metaxas wrote a well-known biography they did a movie about him back in 2006 called Amazing Grace that tells this story. So a lot of Christians in recent years uh, have become more familiar with his story and again, holding him up as this exemplar of Christian activism in the public square. Now your article highlights an aspect of Wilberforce's story that gets either completely ignored or downplayed by these popular biographies. And that's what caught my attention. You make the case that not only was Wilberforce this exemplar of, of Christian activism in the public square and this, and this moral giant, but he was also a profound opioid addict. So talk about that and how that, how that gets uh, dismissed by so many of his biographers. Yeah, so this for me started, I was doing research and writing to talk about my own experience of having been addicted to opioids. And then I'm reading all of these addiction researchers. And one of the things that's common in addiction books is to go through and list famous people who have struggled with some kind of addiction and go through and you can have all of these people, anyone from like Freud to some of the fathers of early med, like modern medicine. And I kept seeing the name William Wilberforce pop up. And I kept scratching my head of how is Wilberforce on this list? I've heard his story told so many times. I watched the movie and I never picked up on this. And so dove back into uh, Eric Metaxas's book, as well as John Pollock, who wrote one of the definitive biographies of Billy Graham and also the most in-depth book about Wilberforce and looked at these two authors of how they dealt with Wilberforce's addiction. And they did not dispute or deny. In fact, they bring up a lot of facts that demonstrate how deep 
his addiction was. The fact that he had tried to quit multiple times and was unsuccessful. The fact that even though early on the opioids were helping with a medical condition, they soon started causing more harm than they caused good. They likely um, cut his life short because he did die of a respiratory disease. And normally how you die of an opioid overdose is that your lungs um, start to shut down to the place where you're no longer breathing automatically. And so all of these facts were there. And then both of these authors, Pollock and Metaxas, kind of stuck something in the ground when they were like, but he was not addicted. And in trying to understand why they would make that claim, it became very clear that they had some huge misperceptions about what addiction is and how it functions that was not just about their mistakes, it was actually mirrors broader mistakes that I think often are made in the church, but in society as a whole for what addiction is and how it affects our lives. Okay, before we get into that, uh, you, you quote Eric Metaxas in your article as saying this, Wilberforce did not appear to become addicted to it, meaning the opioids. He quite admirably managed to keep his dosage from increasing over the decades. And then you flat out say that's not the case. So in the article you talk about, and this then transitions into our, our general attitude about addiction, there's this view that Wilberforce was this morally upstanding, righteous figure and certainly in his public advocacy against the slave trade is to be celebrated. And because of that, there's this view that they had to minimize or downplay his addiction to opioids because there was this view that addiction is a moral failure. And you can't be a moral exemplar in one area of your life and a moral failure in another. So the way these authors, and not just Metaxas, but numerous others have dealt with it is, well, let's dismiss or downplay his addiction to opioids so that we can keep him as this untouchable moral figure. Um, your problem with that from my reading is, is, and it continues to this day, this view that addiction is equivalent to moral failure or moral weakness. Talk about why that's such a problem in the way we view addictions. Yeah. So one of the earliest kind of broad theories that was developed about addiction was simply called the moral model. And the moral model held that addiction was just another outgrowth of a fundamental moral failure. So those who were weak-willed, those who had too great of an appetite, um, <clears throat> it was actually believed for a while that you could not get addicted to IV morphine because it bypassed the appetite system of eating and ingesting something and went straight into your veins. So one of the earliest applications of IV morphine was thought to be a cure for being addicted to ingesting morphine orally. It just, it, it only worked more effectively, more immediately. That's kind of ironic. Yes. The next big innovation that they thought would cure morphine addiction was um, in the German called heroish, which translated into English as heroin. Mm. They thought that by continuing to purify the substance, it would get rid of the negative aspects that caused addiction. Wow. So this moral model <clears throat> made, made it very simplistic that all you need to do is you know someone's bad if they get addicted and good people don't get addicted. So this clearly breaks down over time and with different scientific research, but that initial wave still holds in the back of a lot of people's heads. Today, we understand that there's genetic factors. Um, there are epigenetic factors of being born in a high stress situation turns on certain sorts of genes that push people towards uh, what's normally different positive behaviors of getting more food, getting more of a substance that makes you feel good, that alleviates pain. There's social fact factors, being isolated and lonely people often turn to some sort of substance that might make them not feel isolated for a moment, might make them feel connected for a moment. So we can see now that there's all these host of different factors and that people can be in the midst of addiction and doing lots of other good things. It is not a simple moral failure, but what we often see today too is because Wilberforce was addicted to morphine, 
and opium at a time when it was legal and a time where he had resources to continue to get it. He was not caught up in some of the other things we normally think of when we think of addiction, right? So you can be completely addicted to cigarettes and smoke two packs a day and not continue going up for decades, but that doesn't mean you're not addicted to those cigarettes. And as you mentioned, Pollock goes through very, very um, systematically all the times that Wilberforce's use of opium did go up over time. Metaxas is sometimes known for not letting facts get in the way of a good story. And this was one of those cases. And with this in particular, you can see that a lot of the negative things we normally associate with something like an opioid addiction don't occur because the opioids make you bad or make you morally weak. It's because of how people who are addicted are treated as a result of their addiction. Right. And I mean, the thing that comes to mind immediately is even our criminal justice system has built the penalty for addicts around the assumption that addiction is a moral failure rather than an illness or disease. So our jails are full of people who are addicted or who have behaved in a manner that is criminal because of an addiction rather than viewing it as a need for treatment or an illness. We've criminalized the whole system and there's a lot of factors into that, obviously not just moral, but economic that have played into it. But it seems like that, that view that addiction is fundamentally a moral failure probably holds more sway among Christian communities and churches than it does even in the population in general. We, we, you know, that old stupid uh, cliche of I'm not going to smoke or chew or date girls that do. It's the assumption that to smoke or chew is to have a moral failure, right? So um, how do we begin to extricate ourselves from this centuries old view that addiction is moral failure rather than illness or some other um, factor that's, that's inhibiting us? I, I think this is downstream from pretty bad dualistic theology in which the physical world and the spiritual world are separated in which science is somehow an antithesis to faith. If you've got an integrated view of the world in which God became flesh and dwelt among us, and that's not just a thing that happened once a long time ago, but is an ever present reality that continues to pour itself out through time is that God is present here and now then this starts to get a lot less confusing because we can talk about the medical reality of addiction. We can talk about what happens, the way it changes the brain. We can talk about uh, medically assisted treatment and at the same time, talk about the fact that community and connection to other people helps decrease the likelihood of addiction. We can talk about the fact that hope for a better future gives people reason and gives them motivation and gives them a focus that isn't their addiction and can help them um, move into recovery. We can talk about the fact that people have deep spiritual experiences that help them move from being addicted into recovery but that somehow, that doesn't mean that there isn't a scientific part of this. There isn't a medical part of this. It's, it's a both and. And when we try to oversimplify things, because I think we can make a mistake in the opposite direction, simply giving someone medically assisted treatment without asking the larger questions of what's going on in their life of, you know, did they go to prison? Are they able to get a job now? Have they lost all of their family and friends because of their addiction, so now they're alone and isolated? We get to ask all of these questions at the same time if we have a theology that's able to hold both those things together as opposed to ch choose one or the other. I'm, I'm glad you put it that way because it does feel like uh, in, some, in some Christian environments, we can hyper-spiritualize this and either make it just a moral issue or um, you know, pray people out of an addiction. And in the secular environment, even in some uh, meetings I've been a part of in Washington, D.C., with policymakers, there tends to be this hyper-scientific approach 
of, well, you know, they just need medical intervention for a, a physiological addiction and that's it. And, and it doesn't, neither side looks at the whole person the way you're describing it. And, and we need that holistic approach, which we, we may not be adequately prepared to deal with as a society because we have kind of torn these two things apart from each other, which brings me to your story. Talk about your own journey through this process and what you learned from it that you think the rest of us need to hear. Yeah, so about 10 years ago, I ended up in the hospital for over two months. Um, I had had a small case of pancreatitis. The doctors weren't sure why. I was 25 at the time. They did another procedure to try to figure it out and ended up in the midst of that hitting my pancreas again and causing what they call acute necrotizing pancreatitis. So then I was in the ICU. Uh, they told my parents to come in and the rest of my family to get ready to say goodbye because they didn't wow. think I would make it. And at that point, they started putting me on levels of opioid pain medication that's normally reserved for someone who's about to pass. Um, so I was on heavy doses of Dilaudid and fentanyl. And luckily, I pulled through and I made it out. But it was really clear what the challenge was when I was in the hospital for months and I was in the ICU and going into acute respiratory distress. Everyone kind of knows how to rally around that. And even if it could kill me, it at least had a name and it was easy to place and easy to address. Then I was discharged and sent home on really heavy doses of opioid medication. And it had been a blessing. It had probably saved my life. The human body can't take that level of pain for that long without it affecting other organs and starting to shut things down. Um, but then I'm home alone. I can't eat. I can't drink anything. I'm on an IV for 12 hours a day to get all of my nutrition. And suddenly for me, the only thing that I knew how to make myself feel better, this didn't happen consciously. It happened just over time, was to keep taking more and more pain pills. So after a few months, my prescriptions were running out way faster than they should. I was justifying to myself more and more why I continued to need to take more pain medicine. And I'd had a couple of different doctors accuse me of faking my pain in order to get this pain medicine. So I was really defensive about it because each time they had missed a medical complication that threatened my life. So I was holding on to these pain pills like nothing yeah. else. I sit down with my doctor one day and he looks at my charts and he looks at the prescriptions that I was being written and he looks at me and just says, Tim, you need to know you're addicted to your pain medicine. And in my head, I had that cultural narrative is what I heard him say was, you're a bad person. Yeah. You did something wrong. You are sinful. And all of this shame comes flooding in. And what I think made all of the difference in the world to me and my own story was the thing that was next out of his mouth was, and you didn't do anything wrong. And that completely put me at ease and it reframed for me because I was the one who was beating myself up the most about this. I didn't need him to add on. I had everything justified in my head and all the reasons and all of the questions and all of the doubts that I didn't know how to articulate yet. And then he said, and Tim, I believe you're still in pain. And that then acknowledged why I was using was that there's still pain there. Some of it was still real physical pain. That was not, I wasn't making that up. That was still there. But there was also the trauma of spending weeks in the ICU and months in the hospital of not sure. being certain if I'd live or die of being out of work. And when he acknowledged the why, that allowed me to enter into a conversation with him. So let me pause it there for a minute because um, your introduction to these painkillers is pretty extreme with you know, your pancreatitis and months in the hospital. But apart from that, the story is very similar to a lot of other ones that I've heard, which are people who have legitimate pain from all kinds of sources, whether surgery or injury or whatever it might be, and are prescribed, appropriately prescribed even, a painkiller strong enough to help them alleviate it. And through no fault of their own, it creates a chemical addiction and a psychological addiction. And, and then you're off to the races. And there's been a lot written lately about 
the effort of some of these pharmaceutical companies that manufacture these painkillers to overprescribe them, even for perhaps people that didn't need that level of pain relief. Um, and yet we still tend to view it as a, a moral weakness rather than a, a, I mean, this is exactly what happened to Wilberforce. He was prescribed the, his opium to alleviate a legitimate pain and then the chemical addiction kicks in and you're stuck with it. Um, before we get into kind of the rest of your story, do you, looking back at your introduction, do you have any advice for other people who are, uh, who are tempted to stay on to their drugs or not talk to their doctors about it? Or, I mean, what, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? even though you couldn't have chosen not to have those drugs, you needed them at the time. Is there anything you would have done differently? Yeah. The, the biggest thing that sticks in my mind of a lesson that I learned that could have helped prepare me in a different way is that addictions aren't dangerous because they always lie. They're dangerous because they only tell part of the truth. Mm. And that an addiction often forms not because a person is pursuing something that is bad. It is that they are pursuing something that is good in a way that ends up becoming bad. So addictions normally fill some sort of moral good, at least temporarily. They give us a sense of transcendence. They give us a sense of connection to other people. They can temporarily ease our trauma, ease our pain. And when I think about that part, I think that that's advice for anyone out there to start to ask about anything in your life. What is the role that this substance is playing in my life? And to acknowledge that it can be both good and bad that there can be some positives and there can be some negatives. Um, and then also to ask, are there other ways that I can accomplish these same things or is it holding me back from different ways of accomplishing these things? And another aspect of this is to understand that more and more as we understand the science and how addiction works in our brains is that it affects different people differently. And one of the very common ways is there are some people who they have their first drink and after that it is downhill. They drink till they're blacked out for years until they have a moment that they never drink again. But for a whole lot of other people, what it is is they go from drinking on the weekends to drinking every day. They go from having a couple of drinks every day to having a few more drinks every week for a decade, maybe 20 years. And it's consistent, it's under control, it goes up, but only slightly. And that then over the course of 10 years, 20 years, can have negative health effects. It can go from, I enjoy this, to being an addiction, but you don't know it until you have to stop or until you have a traumatic event that spirals things out of control. So right now, while people are I'm assuming still practicing social distancing because of COVID-19 by the time this comes out, being isolated can take you off of your daily habits and rhythms and can mean that those things start to tick up slowly. And no, it might not be out of control right now. No, it might not resemble a severe addiction like you've heard about in TV shows or in movies but that doesn't mean that it isn't a part of the addictive process and it can begin to spiral further downwards without you being self-reflective on that and understanding your own behavior. So um, speaking of the, the pandemic and the, the quarantine, what are some, what's some advice you give to people to in this really peculiar season that we're in to guard against that, you know, that slow boil and the increasing temptation of some of these substances, what are you doing to make sure that that doesn't happen, for example? Yeah, patterns are important. And so I already work from home, so this was already a challenge. But when we, my wife and I realized that we weren't going to be going out and having some of the other things that get us out of the house, we decided to be more focused on our daily schedules instead of less. Um, we are creatures of habit. 
That is true for the things that are good in our lives. We slowly can create these sorts of moral virtues over time through the creation of small habits, through the creation of small cues and signals that get us to step out or so, uh, outside of ourselves. But the same can be true for the vices that we have. We rarely have, I think, at least in my life, these dramatic moments of deep temptation but we do have times where we can slowly slide into certain sorts of patterns of behavior and we lose those normal muscles in our, in our moral lives if we don't use them. And so right now, setting up those sorts of patterns and also cues for yourself. If you're able to cue when the workday is done with a cup of tea or going out to exercise or something positive that you know is going to give you energy, that you know is going to give you emotional sustenance. Those are the great things to continue to program your own mind to positively respond to those kinds of things because we need those anchor points. We need those things that we can go back to. And then if you are drinking or you're using any other kind of substance, be self-reflective. This is not a message to feel bad, don't do it at all. I'm not saying that for some people, healthy consumption will be a nice way to unwind and relax, but be self-reflective on it. Are you realizing that if you wake up in the morning, you are feeling less energy on the days that you have a few drinks? Be aware of that and start to try to course correct as a result. And that's the biggest thing of, I, I like the pra practice of kind of, a compassionate questioning and compassionate curiosity. Ask yourself with care, with compassion, why are certain things happening? How are they affecting your life? And dive into those reasons with a sense of honesty. Don't put yourself in a defensive place. Put yourself in an open place where you're ready to take whatever next step is best. I appreciate that. But uh, gosh, in my experience, self-awareness is in short supply. It's not the easiest thing to uh, to teach somebody, but I agree with you completely. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to hear a little bit more of your story. You had that very um, wise response from your physician that didn't put you on the defensive, understood the the reason for for your addiction, um, understood you were still in pain. What happened? I mean, we don't have time for the the full story, but how did that interaction with your physician? put you in the right place to begin to recover? And what did that process entail? Yeah. So my story was one of almost waiting for the other shoe to drop and it never did. Most people, what happens in that situation is the end of the conversation is the doctor giving them one or two weeks more of the, their opioid prescription and then cutting them off entirely. And what that normally does is then push that person towards an illegal supply. Mm -hmm. And most overdoses happen in the country, not because opioids themselves are so dangerous, they can be, but because not knowing how much you're taking is what's incredibly dangerous. And that's what happens when you're pushed into the black market to feed your addiction or to continue to take care of the pain that you now don't have other methods of dealing with. And, for me, looking back at that conversation with my doctor, um, I almost thought my story was overly simplistic until I sat down with one of the world's leading addiction researchers, William Miller, who developed a methodology called motivational interviewing. And I told him the story about my doctor and he just threw his head back and laughed. And he said, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense that your story didn't get worse. I was like, why? It was just a 15 minute conversation. He went through and had done a meta-analysis of all of the top methodologies for addressing um, addiction that we currently have. It was multi-site multi across the country. And at the end of it, most researchers were a little disappointed because they didn't find huge differences between all the methodologies. But what he pulled out was there was a huge difference inside each methodology. And the primary driving factor was the empathy score that the therapist got when they were treating patients. Oh, that is really interesting. The primary driver was the empathy there. So even though it was for me just a 15 minute um, intervention that was compassionate and focused on my future, it had a life changing effect. And it turns out 
I'm not alone. So Miller dove into all of the research, pushing back on those tough love intervention styles, debunking the fact that there's never been good evidence that those work or create more good than they do harm. And he, in all of these different studies, kept finding that most people have that moment that they go back to of compassion and empathy. Maybe the change happens right then. Maybe it still takes a year or two to really sink in. And at the end of a peer-reviewed article in the Addiction Studies Journal, he said, the only thing that I can imagine that has such powerful effect in a short time and sustains a person of, of change over the course of a lifetime. He goes, in Judaism, it's called Hased. In Islam, it's called Ramah. In the Christian tradition, it's called Agape. But most of us just know it as love. And hmm. that is a beautiful vision from one of the world's leading thinkers and scientists on this, that we need to do a better job blending our scientific and medical approach to a fact that some of the fundamental truths about the Christian faith, that love is what transforms us, not punishment, that grace is worth giving, that hope matters, and that resurrection is possible in each of our lives. These aren't just sentiments that we have. These are also things that are proven out in studies to be effective at helping people move from addiction to recovery. And I have never shifted my view of conversion and of discipleship and Christian development more than when I started studying addiction. Because if you're a pastor or you're a ministry person out there and you want to know how and why people change and what sustains change over time, go to an AA meeting read up on addiction literature, check out my book if you want. But these are things that I think should be in the tool belts of anyone who's in ministry, anyone who's leading a church. Remember years ago, I interviewed a pastor, I believe from Texas, who um, had struggled with some substance addiction and gone through the recovery process and started a new church for other people who had similar backgrounds. But his, his mindset was really interesting. He said, he said, we're all addicts. Every single one of us is an addict. We're all addicts to sin and we all need recovery. And the process looks really similar no matter what your addiction may be. And he is so same thing you're saying is, is taking those proven principles of, of transformation and applying them to all of us. He said the problem is a lot of us just won't admit that we're addicts and therefore help is more difficult to experience. Uh, speaking of your book, which comes out in June, it's called Addiction Nation what the opioid crisis reveals about us. Uh, you've just beautifully articulated the positive side of how lives are changed, grace, love, hope, resurrection. Um, what is the opioid pandemic in the United States revealing about us, perhaps in a not so flattering way? Yeah, the opioid epidemic is now also better referred to as the overdose epidemic. Mm -hmm. Because as we restrict air s supplies of opioids in certain areas, people are just moving to different drugs. Um, that has gone from prescription opioids to heroin, now to synthetic opioids like fentanyl or carfentanyl. More people are moving to methamphetamines. And we also see that part of the increased death rate is, you know, we've peaked out at a little bit over 70,000 drug overdoses per year. But that's if you're not counting alcohol as a drug. So alcohol deaths are still over 80,000 per year. Wow. And if you're looking at cigarettes, you're adding on a few hundred thousand more. So if you're looking at the total death toll because of substance addiction, you're looking at hundreds of thousands per year. And opioids are just the tip of the iceberg because it's the newest thing to hit us. And I think there's two big lessons here. One is societally, we realize how much we have scapegoated other populations that have struggled with addiction. We've seen native populations be dismissed as this is somehow just a tragic moral failing or maybe a genetic weakness, where if you look back historically, one great author, Bruce Alexander, looked at all of these different First Nations peoples and indigenous populations and tracked the use of substance issues 
it never started when substances were introduced. It was substances being introduced plus being moved off native lands yeah. and removed from tradition. We saw the black population in black in different inner cities in the 1980s with the rise of the crack epidemic. That once again was pushed as that's their problem. And we created mass incarceration as a result to lock people up because it was understood as a moral failing. And now I hope that we can atone for that and we can make some restitution for what has gone wrong within that because the opioid crisis hitting white populations first, I think has shown that we've scapegoated people in the past. And because we didn't actually identify the root of the problem, we're now seeing that it came back even deeper and worse and that it affects all different kinds of populations. There's, there's been a lot of commentary about the, the difference between the way the country has responded to the opioid crisis versus the crack cocaine crisis because of race because the opioid crisis has hit a lot of rural white America, we've tended to view it as a crisis and as a, a national health issue and less of a, a punitive criminal issue were, versus when it was crack cocaine and it was urban communities and African-American communities, it was treated totally differently. So this, this is revealing a lot about us as a country and as a people, not just um, our lack of hope and despair and social disconnection, which contributes to these addictions, but our response being rooted in, in race and uh, prejudice. And oh, it's just a fascinating topic. And Tim, I'm grateful that you are speaking on this because you are a thoughtful, articulate, um, really profound voice on this thing. So I, I am really, really grateful for that. To remind everybody, your book is Addiction Nation, Why the Opioid, What the Opioid Crisis Reveals About Us. It comes out in early June. I'm assuming it's available for pre-order at places even now. Yes. And maybe one quick edit. It actually is already out. It came out last June. Oh, I'm looking at it wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It's June, 2019. Sorry. I thought it was June, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It is already out. So nobody has to pre-order it. You can just get it. Um, Thank you for being on. I, I hope you can stick around and we can record a little more for our Patreon subscribers. If you're not a Patreon subscriber, you're going to miss out on some bonus material with uh, Timothy McMahon King about addiction. I'd love to talk about kind of what you see uh, churches and Christian communities doing well and what they need to improve on. Maybe that can be the topic for our, our Patreon listeners. Uh, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, you can become one by going to holypost.com. There is a support us button up there. There's also additional materials uh, from many of our guests and animatics of some of the funnier moments of our show that you can watch at holypost.com. So, Timothy, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Bisher Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Sean McDuffie, edited by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news.